isn't something one always considers when applying scientific principles to cool scenes in popular films, but this does put a smile on my face. Because what might go down as one of the biggest superhero battles in cinematic history contains a wonderfully geeky thought experiment. What would it really take to throw a moon? Marvel's Infinity War is poised to be the epic culmination of a decade of superhero films, and finally it seems a worthy villain has risen to that challenge. Based on everything we've seen him do so far, the mad titan known as Thanos seems extremely powerful. Powerful enough to apparently bring a celestial body crashing down from orbit. But how much of the much anticipated Infinity Gauntlet strength would Thanos need to do something like this? And what would happen if he did? First of all, because of my schedule, I have to film this episode right now well before Infinity War comes out. No one outside of Marvel has seen this film yet. I would have to manipulate time and space itself in order to get my hands and eyes on this film. So I do not know exactly what is happening in the moon throwing scene. I don't even know if that thing in the trailers is a moon or if Thanos is really throwing it, so to speak. But people are searching for this scene as though he is throwing a moon and it's easily one of the coolest scenes in the trailers and therefore the film and it's definitely the one most worthy of being scienced. Even if we are wrong about the specifics here, I think we can still learn something. Now, though we can assume in this scene Thanos is throwing a moon at his home planet of Titan, which could be our solar system's Titan like it is in the Marvel comic books or just a made up planet somewhere in the galaxy, it doesn't really matter, we do not know how much mass that moon has or how far away it is orbiting. We also don't know how the moon got there. Is it a naturally orbiting moon or did Thanos teleport it there? Whatever. For the sake of decent estimations, why don't we give this moon the same values that our moon has? It is 70 billion trillion kilograms and 384,000 kilometers away. Because the moon is massive and very far away, it's gonna take cosmic level strength in order to bring it from orbit to the battlefield in a relatively short amount of time. In the trailer, it looks like the time between Thanos beginning his pull and debris showing up is around 10 seconds or less. Again, using our moon as an example and modeling this all very simply as a pulling force on the surface of the moon, Thanos in the Infinity Gauntlet would have to give that moon an acceleration of over 780,000 G just to get it from orbit to the Avengers' faces in this amount of time. Multiply this acceleration value by the mass of the moon and you get the pulling force the Infinity Gauntlet would have to apply. And that is 500,000 septillion newtons. This is a billion times harder than the sun pulls on the Earth. But if the Infinity Gauntlet and Thanos actually applied this kind of force to the surface area of the moon, it would overcome the moon's material strength and instantly destroy it. So what if the moon was much closer to Thanos? The Infinity Gauntlet does give him control over time and space after all. Hawkeye, that's where you were. I don't need you. In a still of our moon throwing scene, we see something very interesting. It looks like the moon is already breaking apart and heating up and cracking during or before Thanos' throw. And if the moon was in fact closer to Thanos, this would be happening. <laughs> As the moon orbits the Earth, it pulls on the Earth gravitationally towards the moon's center of mass. And those lines of gravitational force act through the center like this. But from the Earth's perspective, accelerating towards the moon in a circle like this produces a pseudo force that acts to accelerate all objects on the surface of the Earth off of the surface in a uniform fashion. Pick a bunch of different points on the surface of the Earth and add all these forces together and what you get are resultant forces that act to push material towards the center of the Earth and up and out at the edges here as we have drawn them. This is what causes the tides. If Thanos had moved the moon closer to the planet, or if it had just been closer to the planet than we have been assuming, then the moon may have crossed the theoretical Roche limit. 
The Roche limit is the distance at which an orbiting body starts to experience tidal forces like we just went through that are larger than the gravitational forces holding that body together. For example, if our moon went from 384,000 kilometers away to under 18,000 kilometers away, its Roche limit for Earth, the moon would begin to rip itself apart. Uneven tidal forces on the near and far sides would cause the moon to crack and crumble, and debris would rain down and hit the surface of the Earth, and it would hit the moon itself, heating up the moon, which would also be heating up because it's compressed by the squishing forces and the internal friction caused by the these tidal forces. In other words, the moon would look a lot like what we see in Infinity War. If the moon that Thanos wanted to throw was already closer to him, then it would take less force and less acceleration to get it down from orbit to the surface of a planet. And it might even look like we see it look in the film because inside of the Roche limit, the tidal forces would crack it and compress it and heat it up. That all works, but tidal forces inside the Roche limit break down celestial bodies relatively slowly, like over thousands of years. And moons, at least our moon, like we are using as an analog in this example, are made of relatively fragile materials. Our moon has the compressive strength, on average, of concrete. If you do the math, and you figure out the acceleration and the forces that something like our moon can take without immediately and instantaneously shattering itself, you know, so Thanos could actually throw it, then the moon would have to be a lot closer than 18,000 kilometers. In fact, it would have to be just a fifth of a meter away from the surface of the planet if Thanos wanted to throw it from orbit to the planet's surface in a gauntlet full of seconds. This is less than half a foot. Pull a moon hard enough to get it from orbit to the ground in seconds and it will disintegrate. But pull it just hard enough so that it doesn't disintegrate and it won't be going fast enough to smash a Venge face in those seconds. So we need some kind of middle ground, some Balance, if you will. This could be where the true power of the Infinity Gauntlet comes in. Through the absolute manipulation of time and space, the Infinity Gauntlet could pull on a moon, not like gravity would, and not like pulling on the moon with a giant cosmic string would. Either of these uneven application of forces would rip the moon apart. Instead, what the Infinity Gauntlet could do is somehow apply a nearly uniform force to every single particle in the moon. Then all those particles would accelerate in exactly the same way. They wouldn't bump into each other and therefore they wouldn't cause any internal stress, friction, or cracking. And then Thanos could throw it at almost any acceleration. Prepare to die, I'm probably right. If something like this is possible and the Infinity Gauntlet can ignore fundamental physics like Newton's third law, which would fling Thanos right up into space and he'd destroy himself, then we can finally go back to our original example. Flinging a moon from the distance our moon is at with the mass that our moon has would require a final velocity if it needs to get to the surface of the planet in maybe 10 seconds that is best expressed as a percentage of the speed of light, up to a quarter of light speed, depending on your assumptions. Plug this velocity range into the equation for kinetic energy, and you find that Thanos' grand attack would come screaming in from the heavens with between a trillion septillion and a hundred trillion septillion joules of energy. No! An impactor carrying this much kinetic energy has more energy bound up in its motion than our sun puts out in an entire year. If you could see it from the surface of the planet that the Avengers are on, right before impact, if the Infinity Gauntlet is providing nearly uniform acceleration, then you would see fiery debris preceding a cracked and heated moon, just like we see in the film. And then a moment later, you would see nothing. This is enough energy to completely obliterate an Earth-sized planet a thousand times over. It's enough energy to take every single particle of this planet and separate it out 
to mathematical infinity. Fitting. <laughs> so, how does Thanos throw a moon? Well, if that moon is anything like our moon, then the Infinity Gauntlet would have to almost nearly or uniformly accelerate every single particle of that moon equally, or else the moon would instantaneously turn itself to dust. But if Thanos could do something like this, then because of the timing and the distances involved, that moon would indeed be a colossal threat with more kinetic energy behind it than is required to destroy an Earth-sized planet a thousand times over. Even if that moon is a lot closer to Thanos than we assumed, like at the height of the International Space Station, then over the same period of time, it would still have enough energy to obliterate a planet like the Death Star, they're almost the same value. Now that I think about it, the Death Star is an even better nickname for Thanos than the Mad Titan. Because science. There is a very good chance that I am wrong about almost everything that we assumed in this episode. I was just going off of the trailer and I did my best but at least we learned something, didn't we? We learned that if you throw something that is huge at a good percentage of the speed of light, it will cause uh, what scientists call a lot of damn damn <laughs> damage. <laughs> Nobody says that. I do. Thank you so much for watching, Gregory. Another shout out to Matterbeam for their help on today's episode. If you want more of me, check out Muskwatch back on Nerdist.com or go to projectalpha.com and sign up for a free 30-day trial where you can get premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry, including this show two days earlier than anyone else. Make sure to go back to Because Science on YouTube if you want vlogs and live streams and follow me and Because Science for every nerdy thing that we get up to at these handles here. Thank you so much, again. Thank you. This is hard. This is a hard one. I feel bad on the, in my heart.